Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. Afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. From Song of the Open Road by Walt Whitman Spring carries with it numerous possibilities. Rows on the river, picnics in shady glens, seeds tucked into fertile soil. As I explore favorite books, I see that spring also welcomes another form of adventure. As the earth warms and muddy paths gradually dry, our friends eagerly take to the open road. Now, Whitman's lines invite the traveler to take to the open road on foot, but today we'll travel the long brown path by wagon, horse and carriage, and finally, the automobile. Laura Ingalls Wilder faithfully pulls us into the delights of childhood in Little House in the Big Woods. One of these delights is going to town. The wagon trip is all the more feasible now that the roads have begun to dry. Pa drove up to the gate. He had curried the horses till they shone. He had swept the wagon box clean and laid a clean blanket on the wagon seat. Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, sat up on the wagon seat with Pa, and Laura and Mary sat on a board fastened across the wagon box behind the seat. They were happy as they drove through the springtime woods. Carrie laughed and bounced. Ma was smiling, and Pa whistled while he drove the horses. The sun was bright and warm on the road. We enjoy watching Laura grow up in the Little House on the Prairie television series as well. In a favorite episode called Sweet Sixteen, Laura is serving as a school teacher in a remote community. Almanzo has kindly offered to drive the sweet little girl back and forth on the weekends. But on his first trip back to pick Laura up, he suddenly sees her in a new light. He helps her into the buggy and stammers, you look different. You look older. Laura replies, well, I am a week older. With shining eyes, Laura looks down at her new boots, boots which she is sure make her look older. She tucks them back under her skirts and smiles as the buggy takes off, carrying the couple home toward Walnut Grove. The road that stretches before Matthew Cuthbert in the opening pages of Anne of Green Gables is one that will forever change his life. We read here of his journey to the train station. Matthew Cuthbert and the sorrel mare jogged comfortably over the eight miles to Bright River. It was a pretty road, running along between snug farmsteads, with now and again a bit of balsamy firwood to drive through or a hollow where wild plums hung out their filmy bloom. The air was sweet with the breath of many apple orchards, and the meadows sloped away in the distance to horizon mists of pearl and purple. On the trip back to Green Gables, we see sweet Anne's thirst for beauty. They left the village and were driving down a steep little hill the road part of which had been cut so deeply into the soft soil that the banks, fringed with blooming wild cherry trees and slim white birches, were several feet above their heads. The child put out her hand and broke off a branch of wild plum that brushed against the side of the buggy. Isn't that beautiful? What did that tree all white and lacy make you think of? she asked. Well, I don't know, said Matthew. Why, a bride, of course, 
a bride all in white with a lovely misty veil. I've never seen one, but I can imagine what she would look like. I don't ever expect to be a bride myself, but I do hope that someday I shall have a white dress. That is my highest ideal of earthly bliss. Now, before Anne of Green Gables came another talkative traveling companion, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Kate Douglas Wiggin dreamed up Rebecca Randall in 1903. Rebecca is on her way to live with her aunts. Her mother has deposited her in the mail coach with instructions for the driver to deliver her to the Sawyer ladies. Mr. Cobb is willing, yet somewhat oblivious. The sun, the heat, and the dust had lulled Mr. Cobb's never-active mind into complete oblivion as to his promise of keeping an eye on Rebecca. Suddenly, he heard a small voice above the rattle and rumble of the wheels. He turned his head over his shoulder and saw a small shape hanging out far out of the window as safety would allow. A long black braid of hair swung with the motion of the coach. Does it cost any more to ride up there with you? she asked. The stage is so much too big for me that I rattle around, and the windows are so small I can only see pieces of things. Mr. Cobb drawls. You can come up if you want to. There ain't no extra charge. Whereupon he helped her out and boosted her up to the front seat. Rebecca sat down carefully, smoothed her dress, pushed back her hat, pulled up her white cotton gloves and said delightedly, Oh, this is better. This is like traveling. I am a real passenger now. We'll bounce along on one more horse-drawn journey, this time with Ratty, Mole, and Toad as our merry companions. This chapter, I assume, takes its title from Whitman's poem. Here are some excerpts from The Wind in the Willows, Chapter 2, The Open Road. We first find the energetic Toad leading his friends to the coach house. There you are, cried the toad. They saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows. Here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. The whole world before you, and a horizon that's always changing. We later pick up with their journey. At last they set off, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft as the humor took him. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart. Late in the evening, Tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common far from habitations. They ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. The stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and the yellow moon came to keep them company. At last, they turned into their little bunks in the cart. The first few decades of the 20th century reveal the gradual transition from horse and cart to automobile. Lucy Maud Montgomery records the day she and her husband brought home an automobile in a journal entry from May 1918. It really gave me quite a thrill. It is only very lately that I had begun to think we might have one. Seven years ago, I would have laughed at the supposition. When I came here, Cars were so much of a novelty that we ran to the window to see one going by. Now half the people in our congregation have them, and there are almost as many cars as buggies at our church Sunday mornings. Montgomery goes on to admit, I don't know that I'm wholly pleased. Personally, I prefer a buggy with a nice, lovable horse, but I realize a car's good points also as time and distance savers. But... I think I shall occasionally remember with regret the old days and moonlit nights of buggy driving. Anyhow, I'm glad my courting days were over before the cars came. There is no romance whatever in a car. 
Now, Betsy Ray might disagree with Maud's assessment. In the opening pages of Betsy in Spite of Herself, we get a peek into her 1907 journal. Of course, I adore autos. Speaking of autos, the whole town is agog, simply agog about a new boy with a bright red auto. His name is Phil. Well, by the spring, Betsy has caught Phil's eye. Melting snow meant pask flowers to Betsy, but to Phil, it brought nearer the joyful moment when he could bring his car out of storage. The warm weather continued, and one never-to-be-forgotten day, he took the Buick out. It was the proudest moment of the spring when Betsy walked down the steps and was helped by Phil into the high front seat. He went around in front to crank it. All the neighborhood children looked on. After considerable rushing from the crank to the seat to work the throttle, he climbed in beside her. They started off and the wind created by their rapid motion blew her hat so that she had to cling to it with both excited hands. The ride was very bumpy, for the roads were still frozen in deep ruts, and more than once, Phil had to get out and do things with wrenches and hammers. But when they were riding, they went at a thrilling twenty miles an hour. She half-closed her eyes, and a blurred, enchanted world rushed past. The reality of frequent car trouble is showcased in a few favorite movie scenes. It seems it was not uncommon for an afternoon drive to be punctuated by tinkering and problem-solving. In Summer Magic, Gilbert Carey has been given the task of driving the delivery car for Mr. Popham. The car, of course, is a novelty, and at first he is thrilled just to be the one to crank the engine. Thanks for letting me crank her up, Digby. Later, Gilly causes a flat tire and little Lolly Joy Popham joyfully hops out of the car and assures him, Digby always lets me change the flat tires. By the light of the silvery moon also reveals the interest girls take in autos. Forever the tomboy, Marjorie Winfield is typically the one to slide out from under the family vehicle in overalls and grease. Even after a formal dance, when William and Marjorie are wending their way home, car trouble is really no trouble at all. Marjorie is quick to diagnose the problem. She slides under the car in her organza dress, while William meekly hands over the tools. And finally, Cheaper by the Dozen, both the 1950 movie and the book on which the story is based, features the delights and frustrations of owning a car. You can imagine the spectacle a family of 14 would make rumbling through town in the car named Foolish Carriage. In one memorable scene, the Gilbreth family is patiently piled in the stalled car following a picnic. As Dad tinkers under the hood, six-year-old Bill seizes the opportunity to play a joke, a joke which Dad has many times played on the kids, and honks the horn. Dad jumps, smacking his head on the hood, and Bill nervously uses his dad's own lines. That was a good joke on you, Daddy. I'll bet you jumped six and nine-tenths inches. Daddy has a sense of humor and has to admit, Yes, Billy, by jingo, that was a good joke on me, and I suspect I did jump six and nine-tenths inches. Well, friends, it's time for me to close. But before I do, I'd like to thank you for interacting with the content of Idlewild Cottage, either here on the podcast or over on Instagram. Your likes, shares, and positive reviews are helping us reach kindred spirits and build a sweet community. And now, an Irish blessing, the words of which seem quite fitting for today's episode. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage.